policy manager for publications. By night, I head up three uh, professional groups, one called List Bibliometrics, which has um, uh, set up the, the Bibliomagician, so a group of kind of librarians um, interested in bibliometrics. I head up the ARMA, which is the Association of Research Managers and Administrators um, Research Evaluation, SIG. Uh, and last year, uh, almost to the day, in this very city, I was asked if I would chair um, an international working group on research evaluation from, by the INORMS group, which is the International Network of Research Management Societies. So I've, I've nearly used up my 30 minutes telling you that. Um, but this, this session is uh, on something very close to my heart, which is responsible and metrics. What's the state of the art? So I'm going to cover what are responsible metrics, so we're all on the same page. Why should we care about this? Uh, how do you actually roll out a responsible metrics policy, if that's the situation that you're in? And then how do you actually do those metrics responsibly in line with that policy once you've got it? Uh, and then I'm going to ask the big question, who is actually responsible for responsible metrics? And I'm going to end with a call for uh, research evaluation literacy. Um, so, responsible metrics is what exactly? Or oh, this is my definition. It's a movement that seeks to ensure that the use of metrics in the evaluation of research is done responsibly, mitigating against perverse effects and unintended consequences. And why on earth is that important? Well, without putting too fine a point on it, uh, metrics can kill people. Um, back in 2014, uh, Professor Stefan Grimm at Imperial College London committed suicide after he was told he was not meeting the expected income generation target of £200,000 per annum. And there is undoubtedly a growing audit culture um, in higher education, just as there is globally, which is having a negative impact on our academic colleagues who are already uh, facing a higher mental health risk than other professions. So, but the most kind of persuasive argument, I think, for uh, bottom line driven managers for doing metrics responsibly is that responsible metrics are just sensible metrics. You know, they uh, lead to better decisions. So comparing social sciences with STEM on citation counts, comparing early and late career researchers on their H index, judging anyone at all by their research gate score, just isn't going to lead to a sensible decision, let alone a fair one, uh, and who sets out to make bad decisions, right? So the movement is framed by these three responsible metric statements you're probably familiar with, declarations, manifestos, reports. Um, we have DORA, uh, set up in 2012 by the group of cell biologists in the US, uh, which is essentially a backlash against the use of the journal impact factor to assess individual researchers or outputs. It does more than that, but that's kind of its, its main driving focus. We have the Leiden Manifesto, which came from uh, CWTS Leiden uh, in April 2015, which is 10 principles for the responsible use of bibliometrics across a range of settings. And then we have the Metric Tide Report, which came out in July of 2015, uh, which was an independent review of metrics um, for the use of in, in research assessment. Uh, and they came up with five principles for the use of all research metrics. So three slightly different focuses of those different statements. So to signify a commitment to responsible metrics, organisations can sign DORA, they can set up their own uh, bespoke statement on responsible metrics, uh, or of course just do metrics responsibly and not sign anything, right? That is also an option. Um, so what has the response been to all of these calls? Well, List Bibliometrics, one of the groups that I, I am involved with, have done regular straw polls of the community around their response to res responsible metrics um, over the last five years, and this 2019 data is hot off the press. No one else has seen this yet. And you can see that with regards to DORA, the number having signed or likely to sign the red and blue lines there um, has grown considerably against a growing uh, number of people responding to the survey, I should say, but that in itself, I think, is, is telling, um, particularly in the last two years, probably coinciding with the appointment of the DORA steering, uh, uh, sorry, the DORA community manager uh, and Professor Stephen Curry. Uh, who's started to chair at that point. Although a number are still considering DORA and deciding not to sign, so rejecting it. Similar numbers are developing their own statements. Again, the red and blue lines there. And interestingly, fewer consider this and then uh, decide against it. Although interestingly... Uh, DORA is increasingly mentioned by those developing their own statements as a, providing a source of inspiration for them. 
So how are these organisations actually implementing their responsible metrics policies? Well, there's always been a bit of a tension uh, between those seeking to get their house in order before adopting a responsible metrics policy because they don't want to be seen as hypocritical um, and those who actually adopt a policy as a statement of intent. Um, but whatever your aspirations are, there is a general agreement that your policy is always the beginning of your responsible metrics journey and not the end. You've probably heard the expression, culture eats strategy for breakfast. Uh, you can have the best responsible metrics policy in the world, but if you have a culture of poor practice that you're fighting against or pockets of poor practice, that policy is going to have to work extremely hard to have any effect. But the beauty of such policies is that whereas in the past uh, academics had no means by which to call out this behaviour, so responsible metrics policies actually empower academics to blow the whistle, hence my little image there, um, thereby slowly changing the culture in their institution. One thing we've learned is that different institutions see their policies in quite different ways. So some just see them as a source of guidance, uh, which need a kind of community supporting. These are my community support officers for those who are not based in the UK here on the left-hand side. Others put the police into policy uh, and find ways to monitor and review adherence to that policy. And of course, if you're going to do that, you might find yourself having to make judgments as to whether the evaluation activities actually adhere to policies or not. And my personal view is that if a policy is to have any teeth, then it needs the latter. Uh, and as such, um, there is a real need for ownership of the policy at a very senior level. So our survey uh, showed a bit of a worrying trend in the reduction of involvement by senior managers in developing such policies which probably explains why three respondents to our survey made reference to the value of a policy for influencing upwards, <laughs> using it to influence their own senior managers to encourage them to make more responsible decisions. This was a question um, from a mailing list recently from a UK colleague who had been asked by their senior team to choose just one metric uh, to evaluate the performance of our research. Uh, was asking for guidance as to how to deal with these sorts of requests from senior managers. Uh, and Stephen Curry uh, commented that uh, too often it's not the librarians or research managers who need persuading about the responsible use of metrics, but more senior leaders. And I'll come back to that thought later. So that is rolling out a policy, but if, if it's your job to actually run these evaluations, how do you actually do this in a responsible way? Well, it was very interesting uh, to see the responses to this in our latest survey. Specifically, the question was, how has your policy affected your use of metrics in practice? And you can see the responses range from avoid all metrics, ban some metrics, reduce use of metrics, use metrics in line with a policy, Oops. Use metrics alongside peer review. Use metrics in context. Develop new metrics. Use a wider range of metrics. <laughs> so, so which of these is right? How do you actually do uh, metrics responsibly? Well, as I mentioned, I chair this international working group on research evaluation, uh, and to help practitioners move beyond their policy to, to good practice in this space, uh, we've developed this, this model, if you like, um, uh, and also this can help uh, people push back on these uh, irresponsible questions from uh, so-called responsible managers. And um, we've called it SCOPE, uh, which is S, start with your values, C, context, three, um, O, options, P, probe, and, and E, evaluate. And I thought I'd walk through this process in the hope that this might be useful to, to colleagues here. So, S, start with what you value, what does that mean? Well, too often, as we saw with a colleague whose senior manager just wanted one metric to evaluate research performance, we don't start with what we actually value about our research performance and work forward from there. We start with other things and work backwards, the most common one being, as with this colleague's experience, the data that we have available. So this is called the streetlight effect, uh, illustrated by this lovely cartoon that I nicked from CWTS Leiden. Uh, a man looks for his wallet in the streetlight, not because this is where he lost it, but because this is where the light is. Uh, and we use bibliographic data to make so many of our research valuation decisions, not because it's always a sensible measure, but because it's so easily available. The other thing that we do is we start with uh, what others value. So um, many of us, or how many of us, and let's do a show of hands, how many of us come from organisations who have as one of your key KPIs um, a, a, a metric based on climbing a particular ranking? 
Yeah. I wonder how many of those institutions have a real understanding of what it is that ranking actually measures. How many of them are sitting down and thinking, yes, that aligns with my mission. Uh, This is what I want to do. Um, I think we're in a real danger of outsourcing our values as an academic community. And if we continue to do this, uh, and by so doing, losing our institutional autonomy. You know, when we start any sort of evaluation, we have to start with what it is we actually value about the thing that we want to measure. Now, I often say to people, if H index, if my H index is the answer, what's the question exactly? You know, what does the H index actually measure? And is that what we value? Okay, context. Um, I often have conversations about research metrics, as you can imagine, about which are good and which are bad, and it gets very frustrating because, of course, uh, whether they're good or bad really depends on the context, and not just the social, political, economic, cultural context, although these are all important things, but the why and the who uh, of who we are evaluating. So I put together this matrix, which has six different types of evaluation on the x-axis there, from measuring to understand, to measuring to show off, to monitor your performance, to compare yourself with others, to incentivise behaviour, and then right through to rewarding, um, and then a range of entities of different sizes on the y-axis there. Um, So using data for science of science activities, um, i.e. publication trends over time uh, for large entities such as countries, isn't going to have much impact on those entities. You know, there's not much of a risk by doing that. But if you're using metrics to reward, especially at the level of the individual, it's going to have a considerable impact. Um, and therefore, the risk associated with getting it wrong is so much greater. So here's a couple of examples of this. So this is a report that uses CIVAL's field weighted citation impact metric to analyse the citedness of various countries over time. Okay, fine. Um, the field weighted citation impact is unstable for evaluating entities of fewer than 10,000 documents. But in this context, it's okay, because they're looking at countries, they're big, they produce a lot of, of outputs. However, in 2017, the University of Manchester got into a spot of bother for proposing the use of that metric for identifying staff for redundancy. Now, this was quickly swooped upon by the Twitter sphere, you'll be pleased to hear, but the danger of using that metric for reward, or in this case, (laughs) uh, disincentive redundancy, was was pretty uh, horrific. The other uh, big question here is whether we need to evaluate research at all. There's a huge growth in incentivising behaviour through measurement. We just went to the uh, openness profile session before this one, which is trying to uh, develop something along those lines. And there have been dozens of open science reports that state to incentivise open science, universities should start measuring it. Otherwise, it's not going to happen. And the Hong Kong Manifesto recently came out, not sure if you're familiar with this, based on the principle that to foster research integrity, we need to measure it. And you can see the logic, can't you? The Campbell's Law, the way that you measure me is the way I'll behave. And it's kind of effective too. But you know, our PVCR said in response to this, that academic research has integrity as a fundamental value. You know, we, we need a research culture where researchers want to do the right things just because they are the right things, not because they're going to get a gold star. You know, I used to give my toddlers stickers for using the toilet. I don't anymore. They've grown out of it. <laughs> we are in danger of infantilising our researchers. Um, if we, they only do stuff if we give them a lollipop. You know. If we're only measuring something to incentivise behaviour, we not, might need to rethink whether there are better ways of doing that. Options. So the focus here uh, is to consider all our options for measuring what we value in this particular context and not just reach for the numbers and ultimately check if our measure is a suitable proxy for what we're actually seeking to measure. So a good rule of thumb here uh, that I tend to use is um, that we should use quantitative measures for quantifiable things, citations, publications, students, money and qualitative measures for qualitative things, quality, diversity, excellence, value. Uh, And we should use extreme caution. I'm not saying we should never do it because sometimes we need to, but we should use extreme caution when using quantitative indicators as a proxy for qualitative things. Citations do not equal quality. Ranking position does not equal excellence. So here's a good example of this. So this is from the QS World Ranking, and they have determined, that's the word they use, they've determined that measuring teacher-student ratio is the most effective proxy metric for teaching quality. 
Now, I think we could all agree that teacher-student ratio is by no means a proxy metric for teaching quality, let alone an effective one. And I know that the focus of this presentation is on metrics, but I think it's worth pointing out that whilst peer review is often held up as the gold standard of research evaluation, uh, there is a lot of concern about peer review and a lot we don't understand about peer review, as John Tennant and Ross, Tony Ross Halawa's uh, recent paper clearly shows us. Indeed, uh, Professor Alan Dix, who is a member of one of the REF, the UK Research Excellence Framework's 2014 panels, did a fascinating post-REF correlation between peer review scores and citations and found significant gender and disciplinary biases amongst panel members' peer review outcomes, which led him to conclude that whilst metrics are rubbish, people are far worse. P is for probe, and I guess this is where the responsible, responsible metrics comes in. Um, and this is where we need to ask, in my view, five key questions. One, who does this discriminate against? You've developed your research evaluation approach. Who does it discriminate against? How might it be gamed? What might the perverse incentives and consequences be? Short-termism, goal displacement, neglecting anything that's not actually measured. And do the benefits of measuring outweigh the cost of measuring? And this is something we don't often think about. We know that REF 2014, for example, cost £250 million. Did we get £250 million worth of benefit from it? If yes, that's fine. If not, we need to rethink. And it's the same inside our institutions. How much is this bibliometric analysis costing us all? And are we getting that level of value out of it? And ultimately, question five is we need to ask whether by evaluating research we're actually going to make it any better. Are we improving our research environment by measuring it? Uh, our PVCR is fond of saying you don't fatten a pig by weighing it uh, and you don't make research better by measuring it, you know, unless you use faulty scales. Uh, and by the same token, I should say, you're not going to make your research worse by measuring it responsibly. This is a question I'm often asked. <laughs> Uh, are we putting ourselves at a disadvantage by doing responsible metrics? No, because you don't make research any better by measuring it responsibly or irresponsibly for that matter. You know, you might may have, but you might have a more negative impact on your research environment by constantly measuring. And finally, uh, E is to evaluate your evaluation, uh, to always keep it under review, uh, your approach, your assumptions, your outcomes. So that's how we can evaluate responsibly. But who's we? Um, who is responsible for responsible metrics? So I've put together this um, uh, picture of the research evaluation food chain, as I call it. There's lots of stakeholders in a hierarchy, and all are both evaluators and evaluatees, so it makes it very, very complicated. Um, oh, hold on. I can see what you can't. There we go. Uh, so this is the research evaluation food chain. Um, and, and very often you'll see uh, the finger pointed at universities as being responsible for creating change in this whole space. So you'll see uh, reports like this one on the future of scholarly communication stating that nothing will do more to foster change in accordance with the principles set out in this report than concerted work and institutional change in the area of rewards and incentives. Institutions need to change the way they evaluate, then the problem will be solved. Uh, and you can see why they say that. So this work by Erin McKinnon and co. found that 40% of US research intensives were still recruiting and promoting based on journal input factors or brands. But they are not the only stakeholder. Universities are evaluated by funders. Of course, you know, the coalition of Plan S funders are seeking to mitigate against some poor research evaluation practice by committing to evaluate outputs based on content, not container. However, as we know, one, not all funders are signatories to Plan S, and two, this is not the only irresponsible research evaluation practice. Um, so there was a study in 2017 uh, that looked at the, at the use of bibliometrics to assess grant proposals by the NIHR. And one of the questions was, what is the level of understanding of bibliometrics within the panels? And most panel members describe their understanding of bibliometrics as rudimentary, cursory and limited, even though they were using them to make funding decisions. 
So Plan S isn't going to fix this overnight, but funders do have a huge role to play in responsible evaluation, not only the way they evaluate research, um, but by requiring those uh, they fund to evaluate responsibly too, uh, just as the Wellcome Trust's uh, innovative new open access policy has demanded. Then, of course, you have governments uh, with their national research valuation schemes. Many countries have these now, so most institutions will align their evaluation approaches with a way that they know that they will be evaluated themselves and therefore funded. But these powerful players are often driving really perverse behaviours. So I've got hundreds of examples. I've picked on this one. Uh, Indonesia recently introduced a new researcher ranking system that uses the volume of articles and citations from Google Scholar and Scopus for deciding who are the best researchers and for allocating funding to these individuals. And here's the top 10. Uh, number of women in the top 10? One. Number of arts, and humanists, social scientists in the top 10? Zero. You know, are we really confident that these are the best researchers in the country? Are we really sure that just funding those who do well on this metric is going to be good for research in Indonesia? And then, of course, right at the top of the food chain, our apex predator, um, we have the rankers. Uh, these are unappointed bodies who are essentially uh, answerable to nobody, uh, but have huge influence on how universities operate. But it's here that we find the best examples of the most irresponsible metrics. They don't measure what matters, the indicators aren't valid, the weightings are arbitrary, the methods and the data aren't transparent, they don't compare like with like. I could go on, I don't have the time. And finally, we have uh, data vendors. I depicted them as the sun, if you like, in the corner, uh, shining on the whole food chain, distributing metrics to whoever will buy them, often regardless of the impact that they might have. Uh, but to my mind, vendors have a significant opportunity to ensure that the metrics they provide are used responsibly and that the metrics they provide are responsible in themselves. But this is not an opportunity that they have all been very quick to take up, I'm afraid. Uh, they are very driven uh, by market demand. So this is a screenshot of the citation performance of TV physicist uh, Brian Cox from a tool which shall remain nameless. But there is not a single metric on here that I would use for a comparative evaluation of a researcher, not one. And yet there, there they are. And I've been lobbying for five years to try and get that changed. Uh, and that's not happened. So, with so many uh, stakeholders and with data that's so easy to come by, there is a real and urgent need to engender evaluation literacy throughout the food chain. As I said before, at the end of the day, we talk about responsible metrics, but metrics can't be responsible. They are inanimate objects. Only people can be responsible. And I've argued before that we should apply our responsible metrics principles uh, to the people doing the metrics. So we need people who, uh, to use the metric tied principles, are robust, humble, transparent, respect diversity, and who are reflexive. However, if I start with universities, we have a hugely underskilled workforce in this area at the moment. We did a survey which showed that only 29% of librarians who are supporting their institutions with bibliometrics had actually covered bibliometrics in their LIS uh, qualification. This led us to develop some uh, bibliometric competencies. These are in the process of being updated. I'm speeding up because I'm running out of time, <laughs> but I'm nearly there. Um, we also developed a course called Statistics for Responsible Metrics, which is now being run by ARMA. And I just wanted to finish by quickly introducing some evaluation literacy work being done by the iNorms Research Evaluation Working Group, which, coming back to our food chain, focuses on two players, senior decision makers in institutions and the world rankings. So to tackle the problem of the world rankings being at the top of the food chain, we asked ourselves, well, what would happen if they weren't at the top of the food chain? Um, what if they themselves were predated upon? If they were evaluated, they would no longer be at the top of the food chain, right? Um, so we're devising some criteria by which we can rate the rankers. Uh, it's on its second uh, round of consultation, so do feel free to give us your feedback. The link's on there. Um, essentially, we're looking at uh, four key themes, their responsibility, their transparency, measuring what matters, and rigour. And the second work package uh, seeks to develop a set of slides to brief senior managers on res responsible research evaluation. So this topic tends to get discussed by people like me, middle managers or academics, practitioners, um, but those with the most influence uh, on responsible research evaluation practice 
are those very senior leaders in institutions. And I often say I think institutions are only ever as responsible as their senior leaders. So uh, the proposed outputs are a set of PowerPoint slides with notes to brief these uh, senior leaders based on the scope model I've introduced today uh, and adapted to different settings available CC BY and translated into as many languages as we possibly can. So that's pretty much me. If you want to engage with responsible metrics and you're not currently connected with any community in this space, do uh, pursue a couple of these discussion lists. There's a lot of work to do in this space um, and it feels like there's lots of powerful forces at play. Uh, but I always say, better light a candle than curse the darkness. Thanks for listening. <laughs> Is there any questions for Lizzie? Over there, I see. Yeah. Over on the side. Hi, um, CEO Bloom from BMJ. I loved your talk. Um, you probably know that Jeremy Farah from the Wellcome Trust has said we need to be talking about the way research is done, not just mm. the final sort of impact of it. And there's a sort of allusion to, to reference to the idea that there will be metrics for integrity, for diversity, for all those things. Is your group considering those or are you just focusing on the currently widely misused <laughs> impact assessments? Uh, w w when you say my group, yeah, yeah, yeah. The, the scope kind of model... Yeah. Um, well, yes, because the, 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 number one, S, is start with what you value. And if you value diversity, you've got to think about a way of, um, and you want to measure it, because <laughs> that's, that's not always a given. Um, and you need to think about a way, ways of doing that. Um, so, yes, this model very much kind of starts where all research evaluation discussions should start, which is what, what we value. Does that answer your question? Oh, I see. Did the actual lists kind of yeah, those conversations? Yeah, in that's the a really current good question. Conversation groups. Yeah, um, I wouldn't say any of the current conversations are around those topics. Yeah. Yes, sir. Hi. I do you solve the conflict of interests of politicians, managers, the ones running some institutions that even though they understand what's going on with the mm -hmm. metrics, they don't care because they get fundings, because they get prestige, they can go up in rankings themselves mm -hmm. as their career. I mean, this is a very... Yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, you've hit the nail on the head. That That is the most difficult challenge. Um, I suppose we're trying to appeal to their sense of um, the fact that they are leading mission-driven organisations and that they should not lose sight of that mission. Uh, and if the rankings don't align with their mission, that they should think carefully about them. So we're, we're appealing to their better selves. <laughs> Whether that will be successful or not <laughs> uh, remains to be seen. Um, thanks, Lizzie. You, you touched on competencies and training, and then the, the brief point that not, perhaps this isn't covered a lot in LIS courses. Mm. I think it's two, two things strike me. Given the diversity of people and their experiences who go into research management, is it even possible to think about where in, a train, in the training system this mm. ought to go? Mm. And uh, on the other side, if we want, if we expect researchers involved in evaluation, all of us to all be responsible as well. Mm. Um, I'm just wondering, do you have thoughts on where this training could happen and how do we make it something that I guess people actually really engage with yeah. at some point in their career? Yeah. There's lots of different fora for training, isn't there? So, so in terms of research managers, ARMA, um, I suppose research management, research management is quite a fledgling profession. In some, in some countries, that it isn't a profession at all. Um, but in, in the UK, there is now a qualification for research managers, a professional qualification, and they're just looking to revise that. It's going to be a master's level qualification. So that's the obvious place for research managers. Um, LIS, iSchools, they're, they're on this. Uh, I know from talking to a number of them, um, 
so there's that in terms of institutionally and that's our next big thing uh, how, how we can ensure that we train uh, those who are running and and using metrics um, more difficult um, I'm, I'm looking at John and his MOOC whether we can do, do something there it's probably got to be a multi-pronged approach hasn't it yeah Thanks again. Okay.